The following video is just over an hour. If you make it into the first 30, 35 minutes, I think you're going to be hooked. I try to present here something that I've been working on for three, four decades. You know, you never want to say you solve something, but what I present here, I've never heard from any of my colleagues or others, aspects of it, yes, of course, but the entire package that I present here. So it takes some time to lay it out and it's illustrated with slides and I invite you to give it a try. You know, on the internet from all of my colleagues, some of my best friends, and I mean that, you hear everything from Jesus was left on the cross and his body was eaten by predators there was no empty tomb. He was thrown in a ditch, all sorts of things. And then people who do think there was an empty tomb, but they're not sure what to do with the different accounts. Everybody points out that Mark has no appearances, but obviously Mark believed in the resurrection of Jesus. So how do you put it all together? Take a listen, see what you think. And, uh, you know, I offer it to you as a possibility for discussion. Hello, everyone. This is the eighth in this ongoing series I've titled Views of Death, Afterlife, and the Future in the Ancient Western World. If you haven't followed the first seven, you're certainly welcome to dive into this one. This one I'm titling uh, Jesus's Empty Tomb, Getting the Facts Straight. But I would recommend, either before or after this, that you check out number seven, which would really directly relate. What a lot of people don't realize is that the earliest account we have of Jesus being raised from the dead is not in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You would think it would be the earliest, but the Gospels were written much later than the letters of Paul. The letters of Paul date to the 50s CE or AD, and the Gospels, we think, are in the 70s, 80s, 90s, even into the turn of the century. They're hard to date, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So if you want to get the earliest account, you go to Paul. And also, Paul is the only eyewitness firsthand account, because Paul tells you, I've seen the Lord even says he's talked to the Lord, and he, and he means the Lord Jesus. And he also talks about how Jesus, when he was raised from the dead, appeared to him last of all, but in terms of a record, it would be our earliest record. So first person, earliest, I think that's a good place to start. And in that previous number seven, I try to show, and I hope I do show clearly, that for Paul, the idea of Jesus being raised from the dead is not a resuscitation of a corpse, that the corpse or the body, the physical body, has nothing to do with it. On the other hand, it's not the idea of an immortal soul. What he very clearly says, and you can listen to or watch the whole thing to get the details, is that resurrection involves a new transformed body, that is no longer flesh and blood. And that's what Paul says that he saw. But in this particular segment, number eight, we're going to go back and look at those gospel accounts. They would be later and secondary, and they're very, very influenced by theological traditions and, I would say, apologetics. That's the idea that you're defending the faith against critics and enemies, who may say, well, how do we know that your Lord, as you call him, was really raised from the dead? Who saw him and when and where and so forth? This is a pretty detailed presentation. As with all of these in the series so far, I've created these slides to show you to help illustrate what we want to do as we go along. So let me share the screen, as I always do here and bring this up. This is a PDF, so we can uh, size it and so forth and make it fit the screen, and I can point. So Jesus' empty tomb, just the facts, please. 
Now, that's going to be kind of tough because how do you sort out what happened from, uh, you know, what's been embellished and so forth? Now, some of the developments you're going to be able to witness as we go through because we're going to take our sources in order, pretty much a chronological order. So this is a careful textual examination of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, three appended endings of Mark, because early Christians uh, were apparently satisfied with Mark's ending, the earliest followers, because Mark was satisfied with it. And yet, as time went on, that ending became very unsatisfactory to people because Mark has no appearances of Jesus. How could you even have a gospel without Easter morning appearances? Well, we're going to talk about that. It's one of the most important questions when you deal with death and afterlife related to Jesus of Nazareth. And also, we're going to look at a damaged ending of the gospel of Peter. This was a gospel that we knew of from the past, but didn't really have other than in fragments. And now a more complete copy was discovered in the late 19th century. And so we'll be talking about that. Now, I'm actually going to just go through very quickly each account. And these dates, uh, I'm actually going to uh, deconstruct and criticize, but traditionally, it's often put around the year 70. I think all of them might be much later, but I'll go with 70 for this. Chapter 16. So you bear with me. We're just going to go through these. But this one is the earliest we have in our Gospels. Maybe. Hold on with that. But seems like it is when you're just looking through. But I think we might have found something earlier. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, I'm taking that as Jesus' mother, Mary, and Salome, perhaps Jesus' sister, or maybe Mary's sister, we're not sure, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb when the sun had risen, so right at sunrise. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the door of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone was already rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. Let me pause there and just say, as I read these, check yourself out, because I think you're going to find if you have any memory from sermons or Easter services or just your own Bible reading, that it's really easy to jumble them all together and get them confused. In other words, if we weren't reading Mark here and it wasn't right before our eyes, I think many, many people would have trouble giving their own narration, and you'd probably put a couple of angels at this point, which is what Luke has. But notice, just a young man sitting on the right side of the tomb, dressed in a white robe. And they were amazed. Now, why were they amazed? Because when they looked in, that's what they saw. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He's been lifted up. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. Now, lifted up could mean resurrected from the dead. It could mean lifted up to heaven. It could even mean carried away. It's used in the Gospel of Mark when Jesus tells the man to lift up his bed, the paralyzed man that he heals and, and walk. Uh, it's the same word. It's just literal to lift up. So if somebody's dead, presumably they're lying prone, and you lift them up, uh, the idea is they come back to life. Come see the place where they laid him. Notice they laid him. Remember that. The women were not involved in the burial. There was a burial party. So they had laid him in this tomb. But go tell his disciples and Peter, Peter is specified, that he, this is Jesus, is going before you to Galilee. So you need to get up to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. Well, when did he tell them? At the Last Supper a few days earlier, on the night he was betrayed, as the Apostle Paul called it, Jesus says to his followers gathered around, I will go before you to Galilee. 
that I'll be raised from the dead. And they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had come upon them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Now, some of you have taken my Mark course, which I obviously recommend. If you haven't, you'll see the link down below in the description. But we've talked a lot about this in the course, and we've had, uh, I think, four follow-up Zoom meetings for students in the course, and we've discussed all these things in detail. But the way I usually present this is a final scene. Think of it as a drama, almost like a stage. You know how that is at a a movie theater or a play when the curtain suddenly goes down and you think it's going to come up again uh, because it couldn't be over. Uh, that's kind of the feeling you get with this. Uh, how is it that it, they said nothing to anyone? Now, clearly, Matthew, Mark and Luke and John are not going to be happy with this ending. And so they're going to rewrite and overwrite this ending. But let's stay with this ending for a bit. Now, one indication besides Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John not liking this ending is look at this. Here's another long ending that's in the King James Bible, and it's also printed in lots of English Bibles. Often the translators might put a little space and then a note saying other manuscripts add this ending. But if you begin to read it, I'm not going to read it in great detail. I color coded it here because you can see that what has happened is someone much, much later. This is in later manuscripts of Mark where copyists are thinking we can't let it in like this. You know, I mean, Jesus doesn't even appear to people and he's going to meet them in Galilee. Well, we need some description of that, don't we? But see, Mark wants to leave you at the empty tomb where the last time you've seen Jesus is dead on the cross. And he had said, follow me. And all the disciples had forsook him and fled. And now the women flee. And I think the question for the reader is, what are you going to do? That kind of thing. Obviously, Mark believed that Jesus was raised from the dead. But we'll talk about what he might have meant by that. So one of the endings says, when Jesus arose early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. That's from Matthew, basically. You see what the copyist is doing. Take a little bit from Matthew. She went and told those who'd been with him, and they mourned and wept. Uh, and when they heard he was alive, uh, they would not believe it. But then he appeared to two of them walking in the country. That's Luke 24, the road to Emmaus. See how somebody's just adding that. And then he appeared to the 11, that's further in Luke, the same time, and rebuked them for their unbelief. So this is a summary of Luke. This is a summary of Matthew. Then it goes back to Matthew with the great commission that you have up on the mountain when you go to the very end of Matthew. But instead, you get a bit different wording here. It's go into all the world and preach the gospel, and whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. Then you've got signs that are going to follow. This is very much, again, from Acts, the book of Acts. you got the drinking of the poison, casting out demons, picking up serpents, and healing the sick. That's basically what Paul does in the book of Acts and some of the other apostles. And then finally, so then Jesus, after he had spoken, was taken up to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere. That's also the book of Acts, the very first chapter. So I think you can see very clearly what someone has done. It's, it's pretty transparent. This person or scribe has cobbled together portions of the ending of Matthew and the ending of Luke and parts of Acts, the other synoptic gospels, to kind of complete Mark and help Mark out. Now, it doesn't stop there. There are two more endings. Here's one, uh, a little less bold, you know, and a little less obvious, but obviously a forgery, and it doesn't even sound remotely like Mark. Whenever I read it, I laugh, and my students laugh when I read it to them. Maybe you'll laugh. You know, it's just got that kind of pious ring that tells you it's a nice fraudulent ending. This one is even more elaborate. Uh, nobody would even remotely think it's genuine, I think, but 
It does occur sometimes. This age of lawlessness and unbelief is under Satan, who does not allow the truth and power of God to prevail over unclean things of the spirit, or does not allow what lies under the unclean spirits to understand the truth, therefore reveal your righteousness now. Thus they spoke to Christ, and Christ replied to them, the term of the years of Satan has been fulfilled, and so forth and so forth. I'm not even going to read it all. It's just like a mouthful, and it's really ridiculous. That is not the ending of Mark. So go back and think about this. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had come upon them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So to be astonished, to be afraid, Mark wants you to be left with that reaction. That's Mark. Now, I've written this out because I thought some of you might want a screenshot of this to reread it. I wrote it carefully, and I'm just going to read it to you. Since Mark is our earliest gospel, written according to most scholars around the time of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 CE, or perhaps in the decade before, some have held that it's before, I think it's later, we have strong textual evidence that the first generation of Jesus's followers were perfectly fine with the gospel account that recounted no appearances of Jesus. We have to assume that the author of Mark's gospel did not consider his account deficient in the least, and he was either passing on or faithfully promoting what he considered to be the authentic gospel. What most Christians do when they think about Easter is ignore Mark. They really do, because they begin to add all the other things that aren't in Mark. So Mark just disappears, basically. That's why I call my course why Mark's gospel was forgotten. It was marginalized. It was ignored. It was put aside. People didn't like it. It didn't promote the kind of faith that they had come to believe was the original faith. Well, Mark is the original faith. It's the earliest. And it actually comports and fits well with Paul, as we're going to see, our earliest eyewitness. Since Mark knows nothing of any appearances of Jesus as a resuscitated corpse in Jerusalem, walking about, eating, and showing his wounds, as recounted by Matthew, Luke, and John, these stories are simply allowed to fill in for his assumed deficiency. But why would we assume he's deficient? You see the assumption. If you've ever heard anybody talk about, let's look at the resurrection evidence. Let's look at the evidence for the empty tomb. They don't start with Mark. Or if they do start with Mark, they say, well, this is a start. But let's go to these others and find out what really happened. Uh, what if it's not a deficiency? I don't think it is. In other words, no one allows Mark to have a voice. What he lacks, ironically, serves to marginalize and mute him, and nobody even pays any attention to him. It's like, yeah, Mark, but, and then you add other things. Well, he didn't add other things. So we're going to think about what that means. Alternatively, if we decide to listen to Mark, what we learn is rather amazing. In Mark, on the last night of Jesus's life, he told his intimate followers following their meal, but after I am lifted up or raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. And at the tomb, the young man says, you'll see him. So there's going to be sightings of Jesus in Galilee, but not the way Matthew and Luke report it, and even John. But Mark believes that, that Jesus has been lifted up or raised up to the right hand of God and that the disciples would see him in Galilee. In other words, there will be epiphanies or appearances of this risen Jesus. Mark knows of no accounts of people encountering the revived corpse of Jesus, wounds and all, walking around Jerusalem. His tradition is that the disciples experienced their epiphanies of Jesus once they returned to Galilee after the eight-day Passover festival. Now watch this and had returned to their fishing in despair. That's what you assume in Mark. Now notice, this is precisely what we find in the Gospel of Peter, where Peter says, 
So the Gospel of Peter, not in the New Testament, probably early second century. It's very, very dependent on Mark and very similar to Mark in many, many ways, but it has a vital difference. It doesn't stop with the women. Notice what it says. Now, it was the final day of unleavened bread. Now, let me pause there and explain something. Some of you will know this and many people don't. Everyone probably has heard about the Jewish feast of Passover and how Jews eat the Seder or the Passover meal on the evening of the 14th of the first month called Nisan or Abib. But what many don't realize is that that festival of Passover lasts eight days because it also includes seven days of unleavened bread. So when you say it's the final day of unleavened bread, you got to understand this is a week later. You can read the whole thing in the Gospel of Peter. Like I said, it's very much like Mark. But then it ends with this, the final day of unleavened bread. So we're a week after the empty tomb was discovered, and many went out returning to their home since the feast was over. Now, the group that follows Jesus is from the Galilee, and they followed him from the Galilee. So they're going back to the Galilee. There are no appearances of Jesus at this point. But we 12 disciples of the Lord were weeping and sorrowful. Now, if you go by Luke and Matthew and John, they're seeing him all the time. And rather than being weeping and sorrowful, they're beginning to believe that he's been raised from the dead. And each one sorrowful because of what had come to pass, departed to his home. So they head home. But I, Simon Peter, and my brother Andrew, because this claims to be written by Peter, having taken our nets, went off to the sea. So they go up to the Sea of Galilee. And there was with us Levi of Alphaeus, whom the Lord, and then it breaks off. I wish it didn't break off. My guess is they go up to the Sea of Galilee and resume their fishing. Uh, Peter's saying, I'm basically going fishing again. It's over. He died. We're sorrowful. We're weeping. And they wept that whole time for the seven-day period. And they go back. And presumably, they had sightings of Jesus. Now, this would be what Paul says. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, and it's our earliest account, that he appeared first to Peter, then to the 12, then the other apostles, and then 500 at once. So the appearances were up in the Galilee. Mark is correct on that. Mark is our earliest gospel witness, and notice how consistent it is with what we find in the Gospel of Peter. Now, there's one other source that is almost always overlooked. I'm not going to go totally into this whole two-source thing and so forth, but very simply, if Mark wrote first, and these are traditional dates, like I say, I, I would put them later, but let's, say, let's go with it, so around 70s. Mark wrote. The reason I'm suspicious is look how you jump 50, 70, 85, 95. I mean, you know, isn't this kind of arbitrary? Anyway, Mark writes first. He gives the first story of Jesus. Now, Matthew is rewritten Mark. He uses 90% of Mark. That's his narrative core. He puts the order almost the same as he goes through. Sometimes he changes a few things. He adds material. Certainly at the beginning, the birth of Jesus and all of its miraculous glory, and after the empty tomb was discovered, he's certainly going to add some material there that we'll look at. Luke does the same thing. He's got two chapters on John the Baptist and Jesus and everything about how they were born very close together, six months apart, and then he basically follows Mark as far as the story, but Matthew and Luke have this whole collection of teachings of Jesus primarily. Scholars call it Q. And we think it's a collection put together before the narratives, Mark, Matthew, and Luke. If so, it would be our earliest material. Paul would even be earlier, I think, but it's hard to date. We can't exactly date this, but it seems to be from the land of Israel, 
and it seems to be a collection of the teachings of what would we say rabbi yeshua some of his sayings and teachings kind of like you would do for a rabbi like rabbi hillel we have some of his sayings so somebody's gathered together the teachings of jesus as it turns out if we go and look at q there's nothing about empty tomb resurrection of jesus there are some things about the parousia or the return of Jesus in the clouds of heaven, but nothing about resurrection. So if we ask, what about the Q source on Jesus's resurrection? We've really got one saying that might be relevant. It's 1334 through 35. Those numbers refer to the Gospel of Luke because we think Luke preserves the most complete and least edited version of these two sources. Q is defined as the material that Matthew and Luke have in common that's not in Mark. So you can actually just extract it if they have it in common. So Matthew has a version of this also. But here we're going by Luke. So Jesus is talking to his culture, his Jewish culture. Look, your house is forsaken. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a quotation from Psalm 118.26 about the stone being rejected and then becoming the chief cornerstone. Now, that doesn't say anything about resurrection, but this idea about 70 AD is going to come, your house will be forsaken, and you won't see me again. He's headed for death when he says this. You won't see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, referring most likely to the second coming, as people call it, or the parousia, the appearance of the Son of Man. So Daniel Smith has a book. It's titled Postmortem Vindication of Jesus in Sayings Gospel of Q. Smith makes a very convincing argument and looking at all kinds of accounts of people being assumed to heaven or taken to heaven, what we call apotheosis. Uh, you know, I wrote my dissertation and republished it as a book uh, just recently, Paul's Ascent to Paradise. And I go through many, many of those ascent accounts. And one of the ideas is you don't see the person again. They, they go away. And then when you see them again, it's when they're coming in the clouds of glory in this case. This is very parallel to our Mark source. You will see him as he said. And then how did he say, I'll see you in Galilee. And when Pontius Pilate, the ruler of Judea, asked Jesus, are you the Messiah? He says, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. So Smith argues that this is not a resuscitation of a corpse with appearances, but it is an affirmation that Jesus is going to die and suffer, but he's also going to appear again in the clouds of heaven and glory. So it's not exactly a narrative account, but I wanted to include it. Now, this one will surprise you, I think. John should be the latest. John is the latest. But in John chapter 20, 1 through 10, just 1 through 10, you got something that Mark doesn't have, that Matthew doesn't know, that Luke doesn't know. Only John knows it. And it could be that John is drawing on the earliest tradition of the empty tomb. This was argued by Jane Schauberg, uh, now passed away a close friend of mine over the years. And I think she made a really strong argument and quite a few scholars have uh, been convinced by it. What if you have here, it's different. This account is different. You have surviving a little piece of the most original report of the empty tomb. I think it might be. So this is exciting. Now, if you read it with all the rest of John, then it it's not going to have the impact. But notice the difference. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark 
and saw the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Interesting. It reports it, first of all, that she's alone and that it's still dark, not at sunrise. And we're going to see why in a minute, why, why this kind of fits in. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple. So they're probably all staying together. We think based on Mark in Bethany and also in John. The, and this is the one whom Jesus loved, the beloved disciple. And said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Now, Who's taken the Lord? This is the natural reaction. She comes to the tomb. She expects to complete maybe some burial rites, although it doesn't say that. It just says she came to visit the tomb. And it seems to be her first available opportunity right at daybreak on the Sunday morning after the Sabbath. And she goes to the tomb and the stone is already taken away. So she runs and tells Peter and the other disciple. But let me read it again. What does she say? They've taken the Lord out of the tomb. Who's taken him? There's a burial party. Hold on. We'll see. And Peter then came out with the other disciple and they went toward the tomb. And they both ran, but one, the other disciple out, outran Peter. It's a great story. It just kind of has a ring of truth here. You know, race to the tomb. They stoop in and look, and they see the linen clothes lying there, but they don't go in. And then Peter comes, and he went to the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying, and the napkin, which had been on his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, so he was reluctant at first. We think he might have a priestly background. He maybe didn't want to go in a tomb, and he saw and believed. By the way, it's not the fisherman, John, I guarantee you. I think it's James, the brother of Jesus. But anyway, he goes in, he sees that, and he believes. What does he believe? He doesn't believe in the resurrection. If you go just by this account, he believes Mary that he's gone. He's been taken away. But they didn't know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So they're not even thinking. They're just thinking that burial party took him. They put him somewhere else. Notice, then the disciples went back to their homes. Now, their homes are in Galilee. You could say, well, it just means they went back to Bethany. But, you know, it's plural. This is, what if this is a floating independent account? The earliest account of the discovery of the empty tomb. And the tomb was empty, and the burial clothes were lying there. But there's no one sitting in the tomb. There's no angels coming down. There's no earthquakes that we're going to see with the other accounts. I mean, this is really a stripped-down account. She, this is what you would expect. If there's a reburial of Jesus by the burial party, because this first burial, as we're going to see, was a temporary emergency burial, then they're going to car carry him out and uh, put him in a different place. And that's how it's reported. And so the disciples go back to their homes. And it could be that uh, it's just telling you they eventually just went back to the Galilee. Now, why do I say it's a temporary emergency burial? Because if you read what goes before the verse that we have right here about Mary Magdalene coming early, look what, don't, don't make it a separate account, just read it as one. After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple, he goes to Pilate. He begs for the body. He's given the right to bury the body. He came and took the body. He's got someone helping him, Nicodemus, who's also a follower of Jesus. They're both on the Sanhedrin, we think. Notice, they took the body. They bound it in linen clothes with the spices, so you know where the linen clothes came from because you get the story before. But notice this. Now in the place, I'm going to highlight it where everybody sees it. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. Now later, Matthew says, it's Joseph's tomb. This account doesn't imply what Joseph would happen to have a personal 
private tomb that you put on your own property near the place where the Romans crucify people, which I think was the Mount of Olives. I mean, that's not what it says. The point is, as Passover falls and the Sabbath, you have to do something with the corpse. Otherwise, predators will eat it, literally. It's a pretty sick idea, but that's what happens. They're not going to leave this body out. And I think it's for two days. I think it's Saturday and Friday. But either way, even if it's just Saturday, what are they going to do at their earliest opportunity? Because Jewish burial has to be quick. They would go Saturday night in the dark with lamps and torches and maybe some servants. And they're going to take the body out of the temporary tomb. It's a new tomb. Nobody's ever used it. Uh, you get the idea that it's not even finished. And because of the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was close at hand, everybody misses that. The reason he's put in this tomb, and yes, it is empty, because he was moved and reburied. It's the Jewish day of preparation. And then it says, now on the first day of the week, Mary comes to the tomb early. She wants to visit the tomb. She wants to weep in front of it and cry in front of it. Nothing about anointing the body. Mark introduces that idea. But if you if this is the earliest account right here, along with the rest of it right here, and maybe just down here, down to this verse, she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they've laid him. Isn't that the most natural expected reaction that you would get? Nothing of no angels, no earthquakes, no young man in the tomb, nothing about you're going to see him in the Galilee, just the simple statement that he's been reburied. Now, I'm not saying that wherever this little section came from, there's no belief in resurrection. I think there very possibly is. Maybe it's like the Gospel of Peter. They go home and then they experience the resurrection. Now, let's go to Matthew. Matthew is just an expanded version, but boy, is it expanded. You, you take Mark. Remember Mark, all stripped down, where the women come to the tomb, and it's empty, and the young man's there, and he tells them, don't, you know, go tell the disciples you'll meet him in Galilee. It's basically saying, after the feast, when you go back home, you're going to see him, because they're not going to leave the festival, seven days of unleavened bread. So what do we get? After the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the sepulcher. So he doesn't have Salome. And look at this. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. So there is a tradition about the stone being rolled away and found empty. But now we have an angel doing it. And the guards, there were guards. Remember, Matthew has guards. I didn't give that part. And they're supposed to seal the tomb and make sure the disciples don't steal the body. And what happens? Uh, the angels, say, they, they become like dead men. And then the angel says, don't be afraid, for I know you seek Jesus who is crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead, and behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. So you see how Matthew's building on Mark. He's staying with Mark. You're still going to go to Galilee to see him. But in the meantime, he wants to add all of these extraordinary events, earthquakes and appearance of lightning of an angel and so forth. And so what do they do? They depart quickly from the tomb. They go tell the disciples. And Jesus met them and said, Hail, and they came and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And then Jesus said, Don't be afraid. Tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and they will see me. So here you have an appearance to the women. Now, Mark doesn't have any appearance to the women. So you see how this is being embellished and added. Now, many times more conservative readers who want to think of these as eyewitness accounts will say, Well, you can merge them together. Uh, they don't necessarily contradict. It's just four different reports of different things, and all of them are true, and all of them happen. But here's the thing. If the women 
ran from the tomb and said nothing to anyone, that's not the same as them going and telling, even if they told later. And also this idea of you'll see him in Galilee, but here is an appearance right at the tomb. Now, the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. Now, Mark doesn't mention the mountain, but he does say to go to Galilee, but he does have a mountain. Mark chapter 9, the Mount of Transfiguration, where some of them did see Jesus in a glorified state, which would be the way Mark probably believes Jesus is at the right hand of God. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but notice, but some doubted. So it's interesting, Matthew's not willing to say everybody just believed. Judas is gone, by the way. That's why it's 11. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority is given to me on heaven and on earth, and go therefore make disciples and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and so forth. You can tell it's just a kind of a later addition teaching them to observe all things, and lo, I'm with you always to the close of the age. So this sounds very late. This even sounds like it could be added maybe even to Matthew even later. But uh, just the idea that they met him in Galilee and they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. Now, Luke is going to expand Mark even further. What he has is unnamed women. On the first day of the week at early dawn, they went, because in the previous chapter, 23, he talked about these women. And in verse 10, he tells you who it is. Mary Magdalene and Joanna, Joanna, whom he mentions in chapter 7 as a supporter of Jesus, and Mary, the mother of James, which I think would be Jesus' mother, and other women. Okay, so it's a gang of women that come, a band of women that come. They go to the tomb, and they're going to anoint the body. But when they went in, they didn't find the body. So it's been moved or he's risen. And while they were perplexed about this, so they are perplexed, like what happened to the body? Behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Notice two men now, but dazzling apparel pretty well is like angels. So Matthew's got an angel from heaven that's strong and an earthquake. And Luke's got two dazzling men that make you kind of fall over. And they're frightened and they bow their faces to the ground, which is like worship. And they're asked, why do you seek the living among the dead? Remember how he told you when, how he's in Galilee? And then it talks about how he was going to die and be raised from the dead. Now, notice nothing about go to Galilee. Luke doesn't have that. Jesus tells the disciples not to leave the city right after he's raised from the dead, as we're going to see so, you know, what are you going to do? You're not to leave the city, but you're supposed to go to Galilee to meet him. Clearly, Luke has a Jerusalem tradition that he's pushing about appearances in Jerusalem. Since Mark doesn't have any, he can put this in to his version of Mark. Now, what happened that very day? Two of them were walking to a village named Emmaus. And as they're walking around, they're talking about Jesus and Jesus walks along with them and catches up with them, and they don't recognize him, even though they know Jesus. Their eyes are kept from seeing him. You know, what are you guys talking about? And they say, oh, Jesus of Nazareth, he was a prophet, but he was killed and so forth. But we had hoped that he would be the one to redeem Israel. And then they tell about the women. Uh, we heard this morning some women, uh, they went to the tomb early, they didn't find the body, and they came back saying they'd seen a vision of angels, so they are called angels, who said he was alive. And some of us went to the tomb and we found it just as the women had said, but we did not see him. Okay, long story. And then Jesus says, oh, foolish men, slow of heart to believe. And their eyes are opened as he breaks bread with them. Look right here. They eat together, and then they say their hearts burn within them. They realized it's Jesus. And so they run back in uh, that same hour and return to Jerusalem. And they found the 11 gathered together and those who were with them. And they said, the Lord has risen and appeared to Simon. Right as they walk in to tell their story, the 11 go He's risen. He appeared to Simon. So Simon had some kind of private appearance that we don't have a record of. And then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. And right as they were reporting it, this is that 
Sunday when all of this happened, the same day, Jesus suddenly appeared among them. And they thought it was a spirit or a ghost. And then he said, look, hands and feet, flesh and bones. I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. And they disbelieved for joy, but they wondered. And then he goes, do you have anything to eat? So this is Jesus come out of the tomb, resuscitated, flesh and bones, flesh and blood. And he eats as a sign that this is really him and his body. And then he talks about them and how they sh should realize why he suffered and died. And you get this whole Luke and witness. And finally, at the end, he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Now, when you read Luke's account, this line, he parted from them and was carried to heaven is not in all the manuscripts. So it could be, it would make more sense because you got the book of Acts coming up that in the book of Acts, remember, he tells them, don't leave the city. And he spends 40 days with them, eating, drinking, appearing to them, convincing everybody that he's alive. And then he's taken up into heaven. Our best guess is that uh, this was added later by scribes to make Luke kind of complete. Otherwise, you have all these appearances and then you know, nothing happens. But notice this, you are witnesses of these things and behold, I send the promise of my father upon you. That's going to come in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit, the day of Pentecost. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Okay. Now, then you go to John and remember, I'm suggesting the first 10 verses might be put in by John as a kind of original, maybe the earliest account of the discovery of the empty tomb, because it's a, clearly a reburial by the burial party. But the way John now embeds it, it becomes like Mark and Matthew and Luke. Uh, we got the two angels in white uh, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain. So all of a sudden we get angels added. There weren't any angels in the first 10 verses. And then Mary's address, she sees Jesus. Uh, she tries to hold him. He says, don't hold me. So that kind of fits with uh, what we saw in Matthew that, you know, Mary saw Jesus. And she goes and tells them uh, that she's seen the Lord. Then that night, and this would be like Luke's account, he appears on the first day of the week and he shows them his hands and sides. So it's kind of a different account of that evening appearance, Sunday evening of the resurrection. And Thomas isn't there. So you have the famous story of the doubting Thomas. Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand in his side, I won't believe. Okay. And then eight days later, uh, he appears again. Doesn't seem like he's appearing in between. And they're in the house, but Thomas is there and he shows Thomas who he really is. And then John has a whole appendix, chapter 21, that is an appearance in the Galilee. And I'm not going to read through it all, but you've got it here. Uh, Peter goes back fishing. Well, that kind of fits with the gospel of Peter and what Mark implies. They go back to the Galilee. He says, I'm going fishing. And he's fishing. Now, presumably they've already seen him in Jerusalem, according to John. But, you know, that's if you put them all together. But if you just take the Gospel of Peter, uh, they haven't seen him. Uh, they're weeping and crying and mourning and despair for a week. And then they go up to the Galilee eight days later. And that's very close to this, except no appearances uh, in Jerusalem, according to the Gospel of Peter and Mark. So Jesus sees them fishing. Uh, they've toiled all night. They don't have any fish. He says, have you caught any fish? And he tells Peter where to dip the nets. And uh, then they get this huge horde of fish uh, about 100 yards from the shore. And then they got out on land and Jesus is on the shore cooking fish on a charcoal fire. So just like with Luke. And he says, come have breakfast. And they go, they don't ask, who are you? They know it's the Lord, but it's kind of odd that you would even say they don't ask. 
because if it was the Lord, I mean, I assume it is in this account, but why would you need to ask, who are you? You could be amazed, I guess. Anyway, Jesus took bread, gave it to them and fish. Now you notice this eating of fish and eating of bread and seeing Jesus. It's very Eucharistic, isn't it? And it reminds you of this mystical idea that you're going to see Jesus in the bread and in the body of Christ. And so, you know, these accounts, they seem to be liturgical. They seem to be influenced by Christian liturgy. They could easily go into the second century. And this is called the third time. So John has now put together these three times. So you have all of these questions. Now, this is not just to resolve, like, how do we get all the facts straight? It's Remember what I call this, just the facts, please. You could say, uh, who went to the tomb first and when? Who rolled back the stone? Or how was the stone rolled back? Was it already rolled back? Or did angels come later or what? Who was in the tomb? Young man, angel, two angels, no one. John 20, 1 through 10 doesn't have anybody. To whom did Jesus appear and when and where? Galilee or Jerusalem? What was the nature of his various appearances? What kind of a body? You don't have that explicitly, but certainly in Luke you do because he's eating and he says, I'm not a spirit. I have flesh and bones. I'm not a ghost. Okay. Now, I am not going to read this slide. I put this in because I thought some of you might want to do a screenshot of this and then print it out because it is a very exacting summary of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John with all the main reports that you get in each one. You know, it's hard to keep it all in your head. So I spent a few hours putting this together, just kind of each thing. So, for example, you see here, Mary Magdalene, Mary and Salom go to the tomb. The blocking stone's already away. A young man sits inside. They're told he's risen, so forth. And here, the first line, early the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene comes alone and finds the empty tomb. She does tell Simon and the other disciple, but then everything else gets added. So what do we make of this? I would argue the following that the original understanding of the resurrection of Jesus is what we find in Paul, and that if a tomb was found empty, it was because of a reburial, and it would be the most logical thing in the world. I mean, why would John even have a tradition that near the place of crucifixion was a tomb? And Joseph of Arimathea is responsible for the burial. And believe me, no Jewish patriarch buries anyone of their family or now anyone that they care about. And he's taken charge of the family of Jesus and the burial of Jesus. And we have a tradition that Joseph of Arimathea is even related to Joseph and Mary. And uh, the, they have kind of certain kinds of family ties. This is a later tradition. So I think that first record that John gives us might be the earliest, and all of the rest of this is just different kinds of embellishments. So even Mark has an empty tomb. Here's how I would put it together as a historian trying to reconstruct it and taking account of all of these elements, including all of these embellishments and how they come along. So when Jesus died, he was hastily buried near the place of crucifixion. It wasn't Joseph's tomb. What are the chances that Joseph would have a tomb that happened to be just near the crucifixion? A Jewish patriarch is going to bury the dead on his own land because it's very important. Family tombs belong to the estate. So if he is a very wealthy man, and he takes charge of the burial, he's not going to leave it temporarily in an unused tomb that it was put in the body to protect it from predators over the holidays. Then, next step, Saturday night, as soon as the Sabbath was over, the burial party is going to come and get the body. 
in Jewish tradition, you need to bury the body within two or three days at the most. It's still practiced today when a major Israeli figure dies. Everybody has to rush to get to the funeral. Muslims practice the same kind of thing. This idea of no embalming, the body's put in a tomb with a simple shroud, anointed in certain ways, and in this case, put in a cave burial. In uh, Herodian Jerusalem, this is quite common. So Joseph of Arimathea has provided this place. Mary then comes to that tomb Sunday morning. This is John 20, the first 10 verses, expecting not nothing about anointing or anything, but to weep and to mourn. She wants to get there at the earliest opportunity and probably spend the day there and others would be coming of the followers because the festival is over and it's getting light. She goes before sunrise and the tomb's empty. And what does she say? Where have they taken him? And others, the party came early, they moved him. So the disciples didn't steal his body away, but obviously they reburied him. They're gonna leave him they're not going to leave him in a temporary tomb. So there was a tomb, and Jesus was buried, I think. Uh, a lot of discussion about that among my colleagues. Was there even a tomb? Was it ever empty? Was he even buried? Let's take our earliest sources. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 15, that Jesus died and was buried and rose the third day, was lifted up the third day. My sense of this is that that explains the loose ends. And then the other traditions, beginning with Mark, oh, there's a tradition that a bunch of women came to anoint him. But then John has a tradition that he was already anointed before that, at least temporarily so. So the body would be held back from some of its decay by Joseph of Arimathea and the burial party. And if you strip away everything, you can see that everything else is just embellishment. Jesus is crucified. He's temporarily buried. And then he's buried permanently. And as Paul said, God doesn't care for corpses. Uh, that's not a direct quote. That's an inference from all that he said. What does God have to do with an old body? It's like old clothing that you shed off. So when Paul says uh, he was buried, I think there's a tomb in Jerusalem with the body of Jesus in it. And everybody would say, well, how could there be a resurrection? Because they're not thinking of resurrection as resuscitation of corpses. All of these ideas develop later, after 70 AD, when people are saying, well, what about these appearances? Maybe they were hallucinations. Now, Mark is willing to have an appearance that he doesn't even relate in the Galilee. You will see him in the Galilee. But I even wonder for Mark's community if it might even refer to the parousia or Jesus coming in glory. Some of you standing here will not taste of death until you see the kingdom come with power. Maybe something along those lines. Anyway. Uh, I hope that helps. The reason I'm even doing this is because so this is death and afterlife in the ancient Western world. So why would we drill down on one particular story about a Nazarene guy that was killed and buried and reported raised? Well, do I really need to answer that? For many people, they would say, my belief in life after death is based on the idea that Jesus rose from the dead. Many people, Paul says that. Paul says that if Christ is not risen, now he doesn't mean a corpse getting out of a tomb. If Christ is not glorified and transformed into this heavenly state and sitting at the right hand of God, then the dead have perished. In other words, Paul has the Hebrew view of death, the ancient Hebrew view of death. The dead are perished. They're gone unless there's resurrection. And by resurrection, he means the kind of resurrection that he believes Jesus experienced. The better term is glorification. 
who cares about the body? Who cares about the bones? I think this was the original view. After 70 AD, everything changes. Uh, people are killed. People are slaughtered. People are scattered. Some do come back to Jerusalem, we think, but things have changed in tremendous ways. So that's my take on it. I hope you find it useful. Now, last slide. I want to mention two books. Dale Allison, Resurrection of Jesus. It is, uh, what, almost 400 pages. It really is the book to get on resurrection. He and I disagree on some things, but, you know, to cover everything, apologetics, polemics, and history, highly recommend. If you're going to discuss resurrection of the dead in terms of Jesus, get Dale's book. Uh, I'm going to put it on my blog bookshelf so that you can uh, just click on it and go to it. Now, this book, this is Cook's book, John Cook. Uh, let's see, 700 pages. Now, you know what this is? Every account in the ancient world of empty tombs, disappearing corpses, apotheosis, people being taken up to heaven. Uh, it's just amazing. Now, he gives all of these accounts in Greek, Latin, or Hebrew. He translates them. He discusses them. So let me give you an idea of what's in it. Chapter one, resurrection of divinities, all these dying and rising savior gods. Chapter two, resurrection accounts in Greek and Latin. Look how many there are. I hope that page shows on the camera. Uh, I mean, it's on and on and on. Pericles, the Magi, Democritus, Aesop, uh, Alias Aristides, and so forth. And he actually gives the accounts. I mean, you can't discuss the gospel accounts unless you read Cook's book. John Granger Cook he is such an amazing scholar giving us this gift. Chapter three, tombs and post-mortem appearances. You know, on YouTube, I hear people discussing all these things, and quite a few scholars have done a good job going over many of these things in many of these accounts. Um, but to get Cook's book, you realize how many there are. It would take you forever to cover it. Chapter four, translations and apotheoses of heroes, legendary heroes, historical heroes, and so forth. And then chapter five, apotheoses of emperors. Apotheoses means taken up to heaven. Right here again. I don't cover them all, but I cover a lot of them. Let me go on. Here's more. Chapter six, resurrection in Jewish texts. All the Jewish texts that have to do with resurrection. Not just the Bible, Qumran, Josephus, rabbinic literature, the Targums, and so forth. And then chapter seven, empty tomb, resurrection, and translation. And that gets into some of the New Testament material. And then a list of all the sources. This is a treasure. And when you read it, you become more and more convinced, I think, that the earliest faith in Jesus' resurrection was that he was taken up to heaven from the state of being dead and given his new transformed body. And he was, as I used the analogy in the previous presentation, a cocoon dead and a butterfly coming out of the tomb, completely transformed, so that Paul asks, what kind of a body do they come? God will give the dead this new glorified body. Uh, Paul's not interested in corpses. Paul's not interested in bones. And I don't even think the New Testament writers are, by and large. Jesus says when the resurrection comes in the Gospel of Luke, I also covered that in the previous presentation, uh, they won't be male and female. They'll be like angels and they won't die anymore. And they'll even be above angels and so forth. And Paul also says that.
in the book of Revelation, chapter 20, the great picture of resurrection of all humankind talks about the sea giving up the dead. This idea that we're looking for corpses to be revived is something that I think Mark does not go down that path because he says you're going to see him in Galilee, and I imagine it was a glorious appearance in Galilee. Matthew indicates that that was the case because they see Jesus, but some aren't sure what they're seeing, maybe a light and a voice or something like that. That very well might be what Paul saw, some sort of blinding light. I don't know. It's in the book of Acts, but even in his letters, he talks about the unbelievable glory that uh, Jesus has when he has his ascent to heaven. He says that he experienced and heard things that are unutterable, both probably secret and too mysterious to utter. And the book of Revelation pictures the dead coming forth, not in physical bodies or revived corpses or anything of that sort. So, you know, it's really the apologetics of people who want to say, you got to have proof that Jesus was really raised from the dead. You got to have physical proof. He's got to eat with people. You got to touch him. You got to put your hands on him and then you know it's real. And then it's not a hallucination. Well, those views did develop later. But, you know, the people, I think, who claimed to see him early on that Paul reports and he equates his seeing of Jesus with theirs. And that would be Peter and the 12 and the other apostles and the 500 and so forth. And James, I think they had visionary experiences of the glorified Jesus. And there was no interest whatsoever in a rotting corpse or body, even that of Jesus. As Paul said, that's the old tent. That's the old clothing that you cast aside in order to have this new glorious dwelling it is a heavenly dwelling. For Paul, Jesus sits at the right hand of God. Now, the problem for people is outside skeptics in the ancient world and today are going to raise the question, how do we know that they saw what they thought they saw? Or how do we know people today who claim to see visions of Jesus are really seeing Jesus? And believe me, there are plenty of visions of Jesus today. Is that what we have in the New Testament accounts, the early accounts of this visionary apotheosis of Jesus? You know, each one of us has to make our own judgment on those kinds of things. But I think I've gone through, as far as I know, this is the material from the Gospels that, that we need to look at. And I hope you can get some new insights of starting with Paul, our earliest source and the eyewitness source, going to Jesus and what he said about resurrection and the age to come, and then going to the very opening of John 20, those 10 verses that I think might be the original, and putting that together with the Gospel of Peter and Mark's idea that wherever the recovery of faith was, it was in the Galilee, and John also knows that, I think you would be getting close to understanding the birth of faith in the resurrection, or I would say the glorification of Jesus at the right hand of God. So before I close, I want to point this out. If you'll go to my blog, and I'm going to share the screen here, and uh, look up just the term resurrection. And then look at this article, why people are confused about the earliest Christian views of resurrection. Because that article, that post, has just about, I'm going to stop to share and I'm going to go back and share. I think I have my blog open. And I'll show you. Uh, I want to I want you to really see this and close with this. So here's the blog, jamestabor.com, so easy to get. And here's the search feature. By the way, I put this up. Have you ever wondered if Jesus came out of the tomb and left his grave clothes behind, was he naked? And I'm not being smart ass by asking that. Just what kind of a body are we talking about? But anyway, you can read that. Michelangelo thought so. Look at that sculpture. So if you type in 
resurrection. My students have to learn how to spell it. You will get, there's the post I, I did just from the thing a couple days ago. But let's go on down to uh, this particular one. You got all these things and you can read any of them, of course. But why people are confused about the earliest Christian views of resurrection. This was way back in 2015, I'm telling you. Uh, let me start with the opening. I think it'll whet your interest. The question I get most asked regarding the Jesus discovery in the Tapio tomb, which is claims possibly to be the family tomb of Jesus. So whether it is or not, here's the question. How could one believe that the followers of Jesus were running around Jerusalem three days after Jesus died, claiming he'd been raised from the dead if his body was in a tomb just two miles south of the city? Well, first of all, I don't think they were running around three days later because I think they went home fishing and they were told to go to the Galilee after the festival. And that's when they had these sightings of Jesus. And Paul seems to indicate that as well. But this is a long article, very involved, and it covers much of what I've covered. Although some of the things I did today are given in a wider context because this is a series on ideas of death and afterlife. Uh, but I, I remember Michael Heiser read this. And, you know, Michael, who died recently, uh, is a wonderful scholar and He's an evangelical, he was an evangelical believing Christian, of course, but uh, he was very uh, affected by that article. And on his website, he takes it bit by bit and addresses it in a really respectful way. And I think it showed me that an honest evangelical Christian can look at that particular article and maybe learn something from it. So I hope those of you who find yourselves in that kind of a faith position uh, will consider what I'm presenting. Uh, I don't want to slam anybody's faith, but as a historian, I've tried to give you today the way I have been able to put together all the data that we have in the best way possible. And I think it makes sense. And I think it holds together. So. Next time, we'll move on. We're going to put together a whole lot of things from all of these eight particular uh, presentations. Take care, everybody.